recall what some of those images were. Uh, we looked at the image of God as a warrior. We looked at the image of God as a potter, of God as a builder, of God as a uh, father. And now we look at an image of God as a husband. Uh, read this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 54, verses 1 through 8. God, we thank you for your word. We know that your word is truth. Your word speaks to us just as it did to the people of Isaiah's day some 2,700 years ago. And because your word is true, because your word is timeless, because your word is powerful, we thank you uh, that your word is worth our time. It's worth digging into. It's worth reading. It's worth studying. It's worth hearing from. And so we'd ask that you'd bless this time now. Uh, guide me in what I share, Father, that nothing would be um, shared from my thoughts or opinions, but as led by you. And then we pray, too, that you'd be with each one of us. Uh, you know exactly what we need to hear from you today. And so we uh, entrust that to your care, the power of your Holy Spirit. That you would remove distractions and cares and things from our minds that would frustrate us or, or maybe consume us in other ways so that we would not focus on you, but that you would have our undivided attention today. We thank you in advance for the work that you'll do now. Amen. Reading from Isaiah 54. Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You... Who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who was married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth, he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Uh, this is an interesting passage to look at. I think, first of all, it's good for us to stop and look and consider what is the context of this passage. You know, as God compares himself to a husband of the people of Israel. And so think, uh, it's, it's just good for us to notice the context in, in general when we're studying God's word. But, but if you have your Bibles open, look back to the previous chapter Look at Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is a familiar passage of Scripture for many of you. Uh, a lot of times we read this passage or we preach on it or it's part of maybe a Wednesday night Lenten series in preparation for Easter during the Lent, this idea of thinking and about the Savior's great love for us. And so there's that description given of the suffering servant, one who willingly suffered and died, not for him, his own self, not for his own sins, but for the sins of us, for the sins of mankind. And so we have this picture of sacrificial love, selfless love that is given for us because of Jesus. We see that very clearly. And so because we have that picture of selfless love given in chapter 53, doesn't it seem to be a bit of a natural tie-in then that we'd have this picture of great love in a husband-wife relationship description that is given here? And I want to be clear here. God is not talking that he would take one family and just make them a great family for either um, Isaiah or, or, or a single prophet. But here he's speaking poetically. This is an image, a metaphor, if you will, 
for God's blessing upon the people of Israel, his people. And so with that in mind then, I think it's also good to note what's the key idea in this passage. There was a lot going on in verses 1 through 8. But in reading this, verse 5 seems to be the, the key idea. You know, parents, do you remember doing that homework assignment with your kids? They had a paragraph to read and then they had to pick out what's the main point in the paragraph? What's the key idea to take away? It's part of reading comprehension. And I think if we were to look together in verses 1 through 8, verse 5 would be the verse that stands out. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. This idea, this image of God as their husband, the one who loved them, the one who longed to have this personal connection and relationship with them. And that would stand out because that would be a little bit different than how the other pagan nations around the people of Israel would view their gods. Do you remember um, Elijah on Mount Carmel and as, they, as uh, the, the false prophets are seeking to show that their gods were the true gods and they were screaming and crying and cutting out and trying to get their gods' attention. And they did that all day. And Elijah kind of mocked them. He said, maybe your gods are hard of hearing. Maybe they're gone. Maybe they're away. Maybe they're going to the bathroom and they'll be back in a little bit later. That whole idea is that they weren't gods. But they had this idea, this mindset that you had to get that god's attention somehow in order to get them to pay attention to you. And here there's an entirely different picture being painted of God's relationship with his people. That he knows them. That he longs to have a relationship with them. It's an intimate, close, and personal connection that God would have with his people. The very one who made them and created them is the one who longs to be their husband. The one who knows them the very best the one who knows all their faults and all their flaws, all their drawbacks, says, I love you, and I have chosen you. That's, that's the, the big picture here. And then I think we're going to look a little closer here as we look at this passage in depth here. Note the blessings that God promises to his beloved in verses 1 through 4. I think this is kind of unique here. Because, uh, I was just thinking about this, uh, yesterday was our 17th wedding anniversary. Jen and I have, have been together for 17 years, and that goes by fast. And, and yet, then there's certain things in life <clears throat> that kind of come up and make you realize, oh my goodness, time goes by faster than maybe we first realized. Um, when the ambassadors were here on Wednesday night, and Mike Amone got up and gave the introduction, and he gave the closing, uh, and... and Talk to Micah. Uh, Micah is a college graduate and going into seminary now. Micah Moan was our four-year-old ring bearer when we got married. And now I look and I go, oh my goodness, if he's getting older, that means I'm getting older. Yeah, that doesn't quite seem, that doesn't quite seem right. I had lunch on Friday uh, with Mitch and Natalie. And Mitch and Natalie are probably the youngest married couple here at church. They, they haven't even been married for a full year yet. And so they said, I mentioned them, I said, I'm having lunch with you guys, and then, and then I'm taking Jen out for supper for our anniversary. And they said, what are you going to do for your anniversary, Pastor? And I said, well, the kids are gone, so we're going to clean out the garage and stain the deck. <laughs> I'm not sure how romantic that is, but it's good to get projects taken care of and you do what you can. And I say that because I was thinking about that. Uh, 17 years ago, when I gave my wedding vows to Jen, if I would have thrown in, hey, by the way, sweetheart, 17 years from now, we're going to be cleaning out the garage on a hot, humid day in South Dakota and staining the deck, I don't know that you would say, sign me up for that, right? When we did our, our wedding vows, it probably sounded something like this. For better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health in good days and in bad. And then look at the promises that God makes to his beloved in verses 1 through 4. He makes some pretty great promises. 
He says he will take away their shame. He says he will bless them. They will be multiplied. They will, have, they will be prosperous. You know, that's a little different than the wedding vows that you and I took. And I guess I wasn't at your weddings, but did, did any of you make big, grandiose promises like that? If you say yes to me, I can guarantee that life will be great, we'll be wealthy, and things will be great all the time. We don't say those things, do we? We say, I love you, I want to spend the rest of my life with you, and in not so many words, we, we say, I don't have the foggiest idea what's going to happen next in life, but I know I want to do life with you, right? There's a different promise being made here by God. God doesn't say, you know, if you promise to go with me, we'll give this a trial run here and see how things go. God makes some pretty strong promises here that stand out. And we note first the blessings, the blessings that were going to be given to them. The nation would expand in population and in territory here. And so we recognize that even as God addresses a woman who is in a difficult situation, he's speaking the context directs us to the people of Israel rather than to one particular woman. And here, uh, there's a gift of children for one whom that would seem impossible. And, and there's poetic language here. Enlarge the place of your tent. What does that mean? <laughs> we were talking about this last night. Uh, Jen said, okay, Kirk, what does that mean? Why is, why is Isaiah talking about a tent? And I said, if I had to put that into our common language today, I would say, get ready to put an addition onto the house. You're going to be blessed. You're going to have more kids, a bigger family, more love, more joy. The children of one who thought they could not have children will be married and be blessed. Enlarge the places of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. And so then as you enlarge the tent, you've got to lift up the curtains and move them out even further. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. I think of the picture that we have in Genesis of Abraham and Sarah. And you recall that Sarah was childless at the age of 90? And those of us who understand how things work, probably if you haven't had kids by the age of 90, you kind of realize, um, barring a complete miracle, uh, that's not going to change. A and yet, really it spoke of someone who, who did not have hope. Someone who was hurting and thought, this is just the situation I'm in and I can do nothing to change it. So Israel as a nation, apart from God, had no hope. They kept going off to all these other places, all these other gods, all these other nations seeking to make alliances and treaties, and it never ended up working. They were hopeless, and they were stuck. And yet Isaiah calls his people back to their husband, back to their Redeemer, the one who would promise to give them blessings. All that they were looking for, they were, they were looking for these things, they were just looking in all the wrong places. It's kind of like a game of hide-and-seek with little kids. They know who they're looking for, they know what they're looking for, but they're looking for it in all the wrong places. And that was the sad history of the nation of Israel. They knew they needed security, they knew they needed safety and prosperity, but they were looking for it in all the wrong places. They looked for it with the Babylonians and treaties. They looked for it with the king of Egypt, Pharaoh and treaties with them. They look for it and all these other false gods. Maybe if we worship them and the true God, we'll kind of cover all of our bases. We'll be good to go. And it never ended up working out. And you know, we haven't changed much. We don't try to make alliances with the king of Babylon or Pharaoh. But we think, you know, if I just had more money, if I didn't have to worry about paying the bills, or if I could just retire a little bit earlier, or if that one kid in my household would just get his act together and behave a little bit better, that one person at work who drives me crazy, that one person at work who drives me crazy, if they could just get a transfer, life would be good, right? Then we'd be good to go. And we're recognizing we're looking for, our, for uh, these needs to be met in all these wrong places. So too, God promised blessings to his people when they would come to him. 
when they would come to him. These blessings were not only in what was given to them, but the blessings were also seen in what was removed from them. We see that in verse 4. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced, for you will forget the shame of your youth, the reproach of your widowhood, you will remember no more. Doesn't that kind of tie in a little bit with what we read earlier from Lamentations? As Jeremiah wrote and said, the bitterness and the gall, when I think about my own sin and my failings and shortcomings, it's kind of a depressing thing to think about. My own unfaithfulness. You compare that to what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, the things that I know I should not do, those are the things I end up doing. The things that I say, oh, now I'm going to get on the right track, and I'm going to do this, this, and this. Paul says, and I don't do that. He says, what a wretched man that I am. And here there's a picture of shame and disgrace being removed. You know, what was Israel's shame and disgrace? How about their humiliation of slavery in Egypt for those hundreds of years? And then we even think of the Babylonian captivity and exile. And as they were punished for their disobedience, and as they had their heads shaved and were chained together and led off like cattle into exile. You know, it's, it's pretty hard to have national pride when that occurs to you. Pretty hard to have pride in yourself or in your homeland or in your family when you've lost the land that your family had and someone else is taking it over when you're carried off into captivity. That shame would be removed. God would promise to take that away. And so we can see how that can apply to a nation. And in just a little bit, we'll talk about how that applies to us personally as well. But why does all of this happen? All of this occurs because God is compared to a husband and Israel, his wife. There's a beautiful picture there. Look at that and consider that. And, and this is not the main point of the sermon, but I think we just need to address it here. You know, uh, the nation of Israel and their rights, their rights or their lack thereof is kind of a political issue that we see a lot today that's discussed. And I think there are some who go to the far end and say Israel can never do any wrong, and they're 100% all the time. You know, And I'm not quite sure that's true because humans are sinful. I'm mostly Norwegian. I would say, you know what, I love Norway and I love Norwegians, but I think Norwegians are sinful people too. And then there's other people who take it to the other extreme and they talk about, they won't even refer to them as Israel. Uh, they are people who are occupying territories and, and they shouldn't be there. They're, they, they're wrongfully there and we even refuse to, to recognize them as a nation and, and you try to boycott them in whatever way you can. And I don't think that's right. Look throughout the Old Testament and you will see that Israel has a place that is near and dear to the heart of God. And I think you have to recognize that. And is it okay to be somewhere in the middle where you recognize that they're sinful people just like the rest of us, and yet at the same time, God has given physical blessings to that nation that still exists to this day. And he has allowed that little remnant of people to continue on, uh, and who face so much persecution. That's pretty amazing to look at and see. And so we look at that and say, uh, the nation of Israel has a spot that is near to the heart of God. And Christians can differ on what that will look like in the end times, and I'll leave that up to you. I'm not going to try to change your mind on that or share. Uh, that it's not the right time to share that for me. But we have to recognize that God's love and his promises to his people continue on. Can we talk about this now, what this means personally for us as well? Uh, we talked about the idea of blessings that come from God. And so we recognize that the Apostle Paul wrote, and he says the people who are God's people are people by faith. And so this is not just a promise that is given to people who can somehow trace their ancestry, their DNA, 
their uh, Ancestry.com results or 23andMe results back and, and say, I have a physical lineage to the people of Israel. But that these promises are given to God's people, and we are God's people by faith. And so these promises exist to us as well. When we are filled with shame and sorrow and guilt over our sin, God promises to come to us and to bless us and to encourage us and strengthen us. And he says he will remove our sin and our shame. And God promises to love us and care for us. Isn't that good news? And so in the broader context, Isaiah 54 isn't just speaking to a group of people who share a physical ancestry, back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but rather a spiritual ancestry. Those who believe in the promises of God. That would be you and I today as well. And so these promises then are given to us. And these terms of endearment then, your maker is your husband. And it's interesting to note those names that are given for him then. The Lord of hosts is his name. Lord of hosts speaks to his might and power. When we talked about God as a warrior, we looked and saw the Lord of hosts used again and again. The Lord Almighty, the Holy One of Israel, the Redeemer, and the God of the earth. This all ties in to those blessings that are mentioned in verses 1 through 4. Because God is mighty and powerful, he can promise to do these things for his people. And then perhaps it's good for us to look at verses 6 through 8. And as we look at verses 6 through 8, we see the compassion of God. For the Lord has called you like a wife who is deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Uh, there seems to be a bit of a problem here with the wife. Uh, the wife, perhaps, is not as faithful to the husband as she should be. You know, and I, I shared with Ryan uh, earlier this week, I said, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble finding some positive references from the Old Testament that spoke of Israel as the wife of God. Because sadly, many times in the Old Testament, when it was spoken of that husband-wife relationship, it was not spoken of in a glowing terms. Man, this relationship is great. Things are really working out well here. But rather, it was the complete opposite. God was sending prophets to go and speak to the people and saying, you have left your first love. You made these promises to me, and then you've gone off and you've gone after other gods. And God spoke time and time again about their adultery and their unfaithfulness. And so for that reason, God says, I have called you. I was the one who chose you, but you've, from time to time, managed to wander off. And so in a brief moment, I deserted you. And in anger, righteous anger, I would add, God doesn't lose his temper. But in anger, for a moment, I hid my face from you. The people of Israel did deserve punishment. And Isaiah knew that all too well in his day, as the northern kingdom had been carried off into captivity by the Assyrians and the southern kingdom was facing impending judgment from the Babylonians, they would face judgment and punishment for their sin. But the wrath that Israel deserved was to be shortened. God said, even in my punishing you, I will show love and faithfulness and mercy to you. In overflowing anger for a moment, I've hid my face from you, but with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you. The wrath she deserved was to be shortened because of God's compassion, we see in verse 7. And even in this passage here, God speaks of himself as their redeemer. You know, that idea of redeemer is a key idea in the Old Testament as well. I think of Ruth and Boaz, when Ruth was all alone and had no one, no one to care for her, and she was facing a desperate situation and she couldn't fix it herself. Boaz stepped in to care for her and that family. 
to give her and her family a hope and a future. And in the same way, God steps in to this group of people, Israel, who had no hope and no future apart from him. And he said, I will love you and I will care for you and I will provide for you. And in the same way, Jesus is our Redeemer. Perhaps that's the way we think of it most often in, in church language. Well, yeah, Jesus is our Redeemer. Jesus is the one who stepped in to a hopeless situation for you and I. And he redeemed us by dying on the cross for our sins, for paying a penalty for our sins that we could not pay on our own. And so that idea of a Redeemer is rich and beautiful and sacrificial language. It ties right in with Isaiah 53 again. Jesus was our Redeemer. He redeemed us at our very worst, in our sin, in our guilt, and our shame. And in a similar way, God steps in to help his people, the one that he loves, the ones that he's called, even in their unfaithfulness, even in their wanderings and all their failings. And that's good news, because it means God calls out to you and me, too. And all the ways that we fail, and sin and fall short. There's a beautiful word that's used here in verse 8. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you. That idea of everlasting love. It's the word for love that's used there is the Hebrew word hesed. And, and hesed is this beautiful, rich word. It's not just an emotion or feeling, but involves action on behalf of someone who is in need. It describes a sense of love and loyalty. That means you're going to keep on loving that person. Uh, I go back to my days in junior high and high school. Some of my friends had crushes on girls, and those girls could not care less about that individual. But those guys, they did not give up easily. They kept on thinking, man, I really think that girl is great. And every day, every week, every month. And some of us would say, you know what? That's nice that you like her, but I don't think that's going to work, buddy. Maybe it's time to give it a break or, or look elsewhere. And they kept on. And that's just a small picture of junior high puppy love. But it's that idea of a permanent, continual love and affection. Hesed love means God's unending, never-stopping love for you. That love that pursues you, that calls out to you, that, that when we wander and stray from God, God just, just doesn't say, well, you know what? I gave them a chance. They were at church on Sunday. They heard Pastor Kirk's sermon. I guess that's it. They've made their bed. They can lie in it. That's not the picture of Hesed love. Hesed love keeps calling and pursuing us, drawing us and inviting us back. To God. And so in that same way, God calls us. And really, uh, there's a, it, it almost seems emphatic or it, it, to have that be everlasting love. It's, it's really drawing attention to this love, this rich mercy that God longs to pour out on his people. We can never run away from it long enough. God will always continue to call us. And just as God called the nation of Israel through the prophet Isaiah, God calls us today too. God calls us through his word as we spend time in his word and in prayer and in daily confession and repentance. When we confess our sins and say, God, I recognize that, that I've failed, I've made mistakes, I need your grace and your mercy in my life today because I can't be the husband or the wife or the parent or the employee or the student or the child that you want me to be without your grace and your mercy and your working in my life. God continues to call out to us today as well. It's a call given in love. It's a call given because God knows our situation. He knows our needs and he knows that we can't fix ourselves. We need him. And so I pray today that you would have that understanding, that knowledge, that personal relationship of knowing God as your heavenly father and as the one who longs to be that husband, who longs to care and provide for his people. And if God is the husband, it speaks of his congregation, his church as the bride. God loves the church. 
You know, I, I remember that. Uh, there was one time there was a, a, a pastor's meeting that was not in South Dakota. It was elsewhere. There was one pastor who was in a difficult situation. He was complaining about the situation. And another pastor said, Brother, I know that's difficult, but he said, Remember this. God loves his church. God loves his bride. You know? There's something special about being part of the church. And I don't mean just the church with a small c, but I mean the, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church. Oh, God loves his church. And he blesses it and strengthens it and encourages it. So be encouraged that we are a part of that work as well. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your blessings that you pour upon your people. We think of the blessings that you uh, gave to uh, the people in Isaiah's day, even during difficult times. God, you were faithful to them. And yes, at times when they deserved punishment, you gave that to them. And yet even then you were gracious and kind. You shortened that. You brought them back. You have restored. And yes, even now we can look historically and see how you have sustained them. So God, today too, we pray that you would be with us. God, that you would guide us, restore us, sustain us, strengthen us. For situations in our own homes and families that seem unbearable, for things that concern us, or maybe just quite frankly frighten us, God, we'd ask that you would meet those needs now, as only you can do. That we would continue to look to you to meet our needs day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment. And God, when we aren't even quite sure how that will work out or what you will do, we're tempted to be filled with despair. Help us to look back as well. We think of that promise of faithfulness that's given in marriage, to love and care for one another. Help us to look back in our own lives and see your goodness and your care for us in years past. And that as a result, as we see what you have brought us through, that our confidence would be strengthened in you all the more. We ask this now in Jesus' name for his sake. You've been listening to sermon audio from Living Word Free Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. For more information about our congregation, please visit livingwordfreelutheran.org. To go straight to more sermon recordings, simply visit livingwordfreelutheran.org/sermons.